Now, last few items in this belt kit, I have a bandolier. These would be issues to some troops, and I do have evidence of these being used with the 17th. Not often. These were mainly used in um, 1917 when the regiment was stationed on the Eastern Front against the Russians, and during their Western Front times in May, supporting Operation Michael, and holding the land and counterattacking British advances and all that good stuff. Um, these would drape over the shoulder, and they would either add extra ammunition on top of the stuff in your pouches, or you'd be able to get rid of the pouches to clear up room on your belt so that it was a little bit easier to go prone and you would just rip them out and then once you ran out of ammunition you would ditch it. Um, these were mainly used by stormtroops in different regiments. Um, that's what they're most commonly known for because stormtroopers were notoriously um, they're notoriously known for not using ammo pouches in just these. At least that's the assumption nowadays. The other thing on my kit is my, let me get it out of my, uh, well, I'm not going to even try, is my melee weapon setup here. I'm going to show it on this camera. I have my bayonet and scabbard. These are original examples <clears throat> I bought at a local antique store. Uh, the scabbard was made, I think, in 1918. It looks like an Earstats uh, scabbard, so I might have to replace it with a reproduction that's more accurate, as this is a historical exception as uh, the actual scabbards were made of leather with a metal bit at the bottom. However, the bayonet is not an Earstats, Earstats bayonet. It is an earlier war production. Not early war, earlier war. Uh, apologies for the misstep in my, in my uh, speaking there. Uh, so I might need to buy a different scabbard, but the bayonet I will keep. As for this little thing here, this is my bayonet knot, or the trotle. Um, this represents the 5th company, hence the red center and white top knob and white bottom knot with the florals. This wraps around the bayonet frog, which is a reproduction uh, from Hessen Antique. It's very good. It's a very good reproduction that I had to dye. You can kind of see some of the dye there being uh, rubbing off a little bit. For comparison, this is an authentic one made in 1918 that I have, that I actually that actually came with the scabbard and bayonet that I have. Um, I'm currently refurbishing it to actually use on my kit. I would like to keep the scabbard and bayonet all together because they all came together with the frog. However, if I find out that, if I eventually make the decision that this is just not in good enough shape to actually use, I will uh, veer course and stop. Now this, is my uh, bayonet knot. This is a, a uh, authentic example from uh, I think the same year, 1918. Um, it's fraying, it's falling apart. Uh, I think that this bottom part was at one time blue and this middle part was yellow. I don't know, I'm not too sure, uh, but I'm gonna be very careful with that because it is slowly deteriorating and there's not much I can do to stop it. So this right here, I'm not wearing it right now so it's gonna be difficult to really showcase. So this would wrap around your neck like this, like a bib, and you would sort of tie it in a knot. I'm not going to really do it right now because I'm not really in the mood. Tie it like shoelaces in the front, tuck it under, and you'd have it like this, underneath your tunic but above your undershirt. And it would sit there to protect the, the collar of the tunic from fraying against your neck. Contrary to popular belief, this was not to actually protect the soldier's neck although it, I think it had the side effect of doing so, it was actually protect the tunic from more wear and tear than it should actually experience. As, uh, while this was cheap to make, the collars weren't so much. The tunic wasn't that much. So any precaution to save material was taken. And uh, tunics, like I said earlier, would many times outlive multiple soldiers, so it was very important to keep the tunic in good condition as you know, making more tunics was a little bit more expensive than getting new soldiers in terms of ability to fight. As a wounded soldier could still work the fields, a destroyed tunic was completely worthless. So that's what this was used for. Um, this isn't a critical piece. It is something that you will want to get at some point, but it's not something that's super important. 
Whereas um, the undershirt is something similar like that. I'd recommend getting one. You can buy them at Hessen Antique, Nesta of Militaria, and so on and so forth. Again, I will be listing every single piece of equipment that I've talked about here and exactly where to buy them and their prices from each store in the description. It is going to be a very comprehensive list, and if it's too long, I'm going to move them to a Word document that you'll be able to find. Now, I do have a full desk right now, but I do want to show you my tornister and give you a good view of it. So I'm going to be kind of careful here. This is the Zeltbahn right here, and this is the great coat underneath it. I'm going to be doing a video showcasing actually how to wrap these eventually. But this is the front of it. This right here is my mess kit. Every single strap here is an equipment or uh, is basically an equipment or great coat strap that I'm using. I'm, I think all of them are great coat straps actually because I didn't want to buy multiples and get the wrong type. So I just got all one type and prayed for the best. This thing sticking out is my thing holding the uh, Zeltbahn stakes and uh, poles. And this is my Zeltbahn, which is basically a quarter tent. I don't know if it was very different in World War I, but that was what it was in World War II. This is a World War I Zeltbahn, so I'm not too well versed in uh, all that stuff. And the Zeltbahn is all of your, it would be all of your personal equipment as well as um, your rations, your iron rations, stuff that would care for your gun, stuff that would care for your boots, stuff that would care for your clothing. So, you know, like your housewife kit is what the English and the Americans called it. Um, your ankle boots, your gamashin, or putties, and uh, a lot of other things. Um, your butter dish, your coffee tins, your extra socks or foot wraps, your extra uh, undershirt, your extra underpants, um, uh, pipes, um, tobacco, and so on and so forth would all go in here. Anything that couldn't fit in here went in your bread bag. Your bed bag would contain stuff like your marching rations, which was rations that you could just eat whenever you wanted. These rations, iron rations, you ate when you were told. So, I bought the, uh, the Zeltbahn and the Tornister from Nest of Militaria. The mess kit is an authentic 1927 model, which is based off the mid to late war and sometimes early war. It's a hybrid of early, mid, and late war mess kits. Um, and the great coat I bought from Soldier of Fortune, and I need to replace because it's not perfect. Now, I repainted the mess kit a uh, the black color using oil-based paints, which I highly recommend, as over time it'll give a very authentic look, whereas if you use something like spray paint or a paint that will actually stick to the metal, it will not, as they used oil-based paints back during the First World War, and they did chip. They did slowly break off, and when the soldiers went behind the lines, they would repaint them, and so on and so forth. So, after all of that, I'm going to get into how to actually build your kit, and how I would recommend it. I would recommend you start with the tunic and the trousers. The reason for this is because those are the two main pieces of your kit. Sure, you can start with the belt setup, of course, but it's just not going to look right. Go for the tunic and trousers first. It's the main part of your kit that is the most important, in my opinion. It's basically going to set up what era you can what era you can reenact. It's going to set up, you know, the type of soldier you are. It's going to set up everything about your impression. So get those first. Get that out of the way. And before you do any of that, figure out what you want your impression to be. Talk to the unit you're thinking about joining. Talk to other reenactors. Uh, do a lot of research on it. Watch my videos, I guess, if I'm if they're good enough, and so on and so forth. But buy the tunic and trousers first. And while I would say that you can go cheap, and the next video is going to be on actually building your kit, um, what you know, in going through the process of um, building a kit on a budget, it isn't something that you might want to do. If you have the money don't buy cheap because you will end up spending more money in the long run to keep it authentic. If your goal is to do it on a budget and that's all you want to do, there are ways to do it and I will talk about those later. But get the tunic and trousers first. The next thing is to get the belt. Get a belt with a belt buckle and get ammo pouches, bread bag, and bread bag straps. You'll also want to get a stall helm or pickle hub depending on the era that you're actually reenacting. A Feldmutz is nice but they, those weren't often worn in combat. You want to get your tunic and trousers, then your belt with the 
uh, Gavir 98 pouches and bread bag, and you're going to also want to get a stall helm. Well, I would personally recommend buying authentic stall helms for your helmet. It might be more practical to at first buy a reproduction. Reproductions are more customizable without the threat of ruining something historic, of historical significance, and they're cheaper. They are, however, heavier than your authentic ones for some odd reason, and a little bit more cumbersome to use, and there is the chance of buying one that is entirely inaccurate. After doing that, you're going to want to go off and buy some of the more nitty-gritty items, some of the more completion items that are going to add a lot to your kit. I would recommend getting your this setup. Um, a shovel, a well, entrenching tool, um, entrenching tool carrier, bayonet frog, bayonet scabbard, bayonet, all, Gavir 98 bayonet and scabbard. Do not get a car 98 bayonet scabbard. Very different things. And a bayonet not once you know more information about your unit that you plan on joining or reenacting. Because this represents what company you're part of. This is of the fifth company. Audio quality just decreased because my mic right here just cut because of the card being full and it's too late and I'm too close to the end to actually reset it. So, sorry about the audio change. You're probably going to hear my fan in the background because without it, I would be burning up right now because of uh, this room it was already hot before I started this video and I'm wearing wool right now. Anyway, my spade's accurate. Well, my spade is an authentic one and I'd highly recommend getting one of those as well just because they're... They're really cool. Most of the authentic ones, you can see evidence of sharpening of the edge, specifically for uh, melee combat. So, it's they're just very cool items. Um, after you get this set up, get a fell flask. Um, it, it only matters depending on your unit as to which type you get. Um, although I would recommend the M10 as your first one, as you can borrow all the parts to make an M15, uh, except for the uh, cork. Granted, I custom made my own cork for my M15 as the first one that I got disintegrated when I got it in the mail. So, the next thing. Now, there are a lot of reenactors, and depending on the unit you actually go to, some of them require a gas mask over everything else. So you might want to get this first. Gas mask you can really get at any point, but for a complete World War I uniform, you need a gas mask, and I might actually recommend you get that before you get the Feld Flash, or your entrenching tools, or your belt. The M15 gas mask with the uh, bag. There's the M15 gas mask with the number one canister, which was a smaller one, M15 gas mask with the number two, or the M17 with the number two canister. You're going to want to get the accurate straps for it as well. Now, for your tunic, something I forgot to mention is you're going to want to get the uh, proper shoulder boards with your regimental number, and a lot of reenactors recommend you sew them on. I'm not sewing mine on because I don't know what the future holds for me. I do want to stay with the 17th, but I am planning to move to the East Coast in about... Uh, year and a half, and I don't know how big the 17th is going to grow in that time, and I don't know if I'll be able to stay with the regiment when I move over there. So I want to be able to have some flexibility. However, if you know for sure that you're going to stick with that regiment, sew on your shoulder boards. I'm forever going to be attached to the 17th, but if I want to switch up between regiments, I do want that flexibility. That's what I meant to say. I'm not going to leave the 17th. That'd be stupid. I help build the regiment. I don't want to leave it in the dust. Now, after doing all that, you're probably wondering where the boots come in. And here's the thing. The boots are probably the last thing you want to get if you if money is something that you're sort of iffy on. All these things can be bought piece by piece because if they're authentic, they're expensive. But if you're getting the reproduction ones, you can buy one at a time for about $60 at the most. If it's the tunic, the most you're going to spend on it is about $250 plus shipping. Um and all that stuff. For the boots, if you have a brown pair of hiking shoes, you can use those as ankle boot substitutes. You wear some putties or some gaiters, and you're fine. Don't go off and get a World War II or Cold War pair, because they might be cheaper. Get yourself a pair of multi-purpose boots that you can use for hiking, or that is mainly used for hiking or work, that can be substituted and look decent enough for a pair of ankle boots. For me, for my substitute, I actually had a pair of dress boots. Not really dress boots. They were um, leather boots made by uh, a pretty good leather shoe company, and they were based off the world... They were made by the company that made the jump boots for the 101st Airborne, for the Airborne divisions during World War II for America. This company still exists today, and they mainly make dress shoes. However, they also make a pair of boots based off the boot that they made for the Airborne Divisions called Normandy Boots. And I own two pairs of those. 
I use those as my main ankle boot for most times when using my uniform, and they look reasonably the same. I know that not everyone's going to have that same um, that same uh, thing to use. So hiking boots work. A good pair of hiking boots that are brown work as great substitutes. This is not a permanent solution. Get yourself a pair of good reproduction boots as soon as possible. Do not get a pair of authentic ones and try to refurbish them. You will ruin them and destroy their historical value. Now, when I say as soon as possible, I mean once you reach the point where you need boots, where like you've got the rest of the kit made except for maybe the Tornister pack, get the boots. Get them as soon as you can because you need them. I would get jack boots before you get the ankle boots because you have the substitutes for them. Jack boots are important because they were most commonly used. Even though a lot of reenactors use ankle boots with the putties, those were not commonly used until 19, late 1917 and then 1918 as leather became of shorter supply and they could only really provide ankle boots due to the immense amount of leather jack boots take to make. So if you're doing anything before 1917, Putties are the historical exception. I mean, wearing ankle boots into combat was the historical exception, not the norm. So definitely take that into consideration when you build your impression as well. And using jack boots is kind of the historical exception when you hit 1918. I hope that this helped you. Um, this is probably split into multiple parts at this point, and I apologize for that. In the next part, I will be talking about doing a uniform on, the bu on a budget and giving just some closing thoughts on this series. And uh, so I will uh, probably be splitting this up into multiple parts, and then I will have one final part to close everything else up, um, talking about uniforms on a budget and all that other good stuff. After this, I plan on doing a couple other series on uh, the 17th Infantry Regiment's history, Reserve Infantry Regiment's history, as well as a lot of different tutorials that will be released during this series run. And last but not least, um, uh, small little videos of me shooting my rifle, or of just me goofing around with some friends. Um, so, see you in the next one, and uh, take care, camaraden.